Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of V Brown Bag. Tonight, we are going to be talking with Diamond Jorsling about what is OpenShift and what does it have to do with Kubernetes. Um, so this is going to be an you know good episode. Lots of good stuff. Really enjoy. I personally really enjoy talking about Kubernetes. I have a lot to learn about it, and OpenShift is definitely a thing I I have to learn. So I'm excited to talk with Diamond. Um, before we get started, oh, let me just back up a little bit. Uh, so Diamond uh, works currently for Microsoft and specializes in Red Hat OpenShift, AWS, CI CD for container-based workloads. And uh, I think also Python, I read Python and, and Bash. Is that in scripting? Is that something I read there, Diamond? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> are, you, are you just reading off her LinkedIn profile right now? Like, <laughs> no. Diamond, just... Diamond enjoys long walks on the beach, well, this... uh, hold, holding hands. <laughs> uh, a sta her, her steak, she enjoys medium rare. Come on. <laughs> it's a combination of that plus the, the pre-show talk. Come on, Chris. All right. <laughs> so um, yeah, so, so, so <laughs> Diamond's been working, how long have you been working with OpenShift uh, and, and Kubernetes, Diamond? I've been working with OpenShift and Kubernetes for about a year now. Um, first, I first started out with it with IBM, so about a year. And, okay, and great. you just recently got on over at, at old good old Microsoft. Switching cloud providers to Azure. <laughs> and, and, you've, and you've flipped over to the evil empire. You now work for Azure, congratulations. <laughs> I mean, I you work for Microsoft. That's a fantastic. So, full disclosure, Sean, Sean and I, we we are cloud agnostic, but we do spend a lot of time in AWS. So there will be some friendly banter and some rivalry going on this evening. Uh, <laughs> just I'm just I'm just letting you know it's 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 in our DNA apparently. <laughs> congratulations on the new role, by the way. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> um. But, um before, before we get into that, a couple of show notes. If you want to get in on the conversation, I will be paying attention on the back end. Uh, if you at V Brown Bag or hashtag V Brown Bag, I'll be paying attention on Twitter. Um, if you do want to, and I highly encourage you to do it, follow Diamond Jorsling on Twitter. She is at Engineered Curls. Amazing Twitter handle, by the way. Kudos to that one. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. No, I, 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 I was like, oh, that's that's great because she's got and, and yeah, I know I, I loved it. As soon as I saw, it, I was like, that is a great name. Um, I'm I'm at Mistwire. I discourage you from following me on Twitter. It's it's a uh, it's just just uh, it's cat pictures and and pictures of of food. That's it. That's all I do. What about you, Sean? What do you do? Uh, well, recently I've been tweeting a lot about Emacs because it's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, I post tech stuff, you know, and recently, extremely and, and I guess, niche, hyper nerdy. <laughs> tech and, stuff. And, and recently, uh, you know, yeah, given I've been doom scrolling, scrolling lately, but that's, you know, hmm. anyway, yeah, anyway, <laughs> so, uh, with that, let's get on with the show. So, uh, diamond, uh, I will pass the ball over to you. Cool. Let me share my screen. There we go. Am I sharing your screen? We can share your screen. We can see your screen. Yes. The answer is positive. Yes. Okay. You can see the PowerPoint. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we can. Cool. So Today I'll be talking about uh, what is OpenShift and what does it have to do with Kubernetes. Um, I chose this topic because I'm always getting questions about what OpenShift is and how does it relate to Kubernetes and why aren't you use, or why aren't you just using Kubernetes and why are you using OpenShift? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and what OpenShift is and kind of how it integrates with Kubernetes and all of that stuff. So let's get started. Go to the next page. You have to excuse me as well. It's my first time using the presentation version of my software that I'm using. <laughs> so let me go to the next slide. There we go. I, so I love I it when we demo stuff live. 
<laughs> figure out all the stuff that breaks. It's amazing. It's, it, you know, it's the best, best way to do it. <laughs> it is, absolutely. Just do it in front of a bunch of people and get really good at it really fast. <laughs> so I did create an agenda. So we're going to talk about four things today. Kind of an introduction into myself a little bit further than what we just did. And then going into OpenShift and then comparing OpenShift with Kubernetes. And then kind of how can someone learn to use OpenShift. So let's move on into me. So I guess we can talk a little bit about how I even started in this little area, this space. I was an application developer apprentice with IBM, and I learned uh, basically the full stack, and I learned about microservices, and that's kind of how I got into, or maybe how I got interested into Kubernetes and OpenShift, and I was like, oh, this is kind of a cool space. I want to be in here, and kind of fell into the site reliability engineer role. So as I finished my apprenticeship program, I joined the full-time IBM <laughs> as an associate DevSecOps consultant in the SRE space. And I was also an Amazon community builder, um, but now I am a junior SRE at Microsoft on the Azure Kubernetes team. So that's a little bit about me. And uh, we can move a little bit forward now. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about what is OpenShift. So uh, OpenShift is a hybrid cloud enterprise Kubernetes platform. It's built around uh, Docker containers and it's kind of orchestrated and managed by Kubernetes. And it sits on the Red Hat Enterprise Linux kind of foundation. <laughs> so it kind of allows you to manage and deploy your and containerize your applications in the cloud. And it simplifies your application development approach. And it kind of takes away your, your error prone issues, if you will, because it automates a lot of the stuff that you would have to do manually if you were just use Kubernetes by itself. And one of the goals of OpenShift is to kind of make a more standard approach to how you containerize your deployments. So if we go back a little bit further, <laughs> OpenShift was kind of released back in 2011. So it was released before Kubernetes was even made. Because if you know, Kubernetes was made in 2014. So OpenShift originally had its own uh, Linux containers and it ran off of um, Gears. But the, the thing about when it ran off of Gears, you couldn't really scale it. It was kind of just in one area, you couldn't really go a little bit, you couldn't really go that much further. So uh, Red Hat kind of was like, well, we need to do something and let's figure something out. So uh, that was version in one and two. And in version three, it's kind of when they just, not, not discovered, but they uh, integrated Docker and Kubernetes. And how they did that was basically they saw Docker, they had a huge community and they were contributing and making new code bases. And it was basically a way for Red Hat to kind of take in Docker and kind of make it into this microservices architecture kind of thing. And it was helpful because again, Docker had a large community. They always get constant updates. So it kind of brought OpenShift up a little further into what developers might use. And they kind of, and they added Kubernetes as well because it created a way for them to basically deploy more than one container at one time. So they took away their gears that they were using before and they were using the Kubernetes containers now. And Kubernetes as well had a huge community and they saw what Google was doing and Google was like kind of like that top competitor using Kubernetes that kind of had a whole team and so they made Kubernetes this great thing. And Red Hat was like, why do something? Why compete when you can combine into one huge community and basically contribute and you know, make things a lot better? And at the time, OpenShift was closed by joining with Kubernetes. It, it kind of became into this, uh, what do you call it? Open source. So they, it was open source slash closed application, if that makes sense. And so let's move over into the breakdown of what OpenShift kind of is. So, so it was break. closed sourced OpenShift? Yeah, so it's basically <laughs> like, so OpenShift itself is a product. So it's, it's kind of, it's closed where you really can't contribute to the OpenShift code as much, but it's hosted on Kubernetes, which is open source. It's before, kind of before, before they release it to open source, was it called closed shift? <laughs> that actually would have been an interesting name to have. But no. <laughs> All right, never mind. Sorry, I'm stupid. 
<laughs> not at all. So uh, if we look into kind of how OpenShift is set up, you have this fancy uh, diagram that I made. <laughs> so at the bottom, you have the uh, kind of like your infrastructure layer, and that has the operating system, and it could either be on your cloud provider's virtual machine or maybe a server, things of that sort. It kind of ties into with OpenShift, you can use it on any other, you can use it on multiple clouds and not just one cloud by itself. So if you kind of move up to the um, operating system layer, which is where the Linux system sits, it sits on top of the infrastructure layer. So if you move up into the orchestrator, orchestration layer is where Kubernetes is, and it's sitting on the operating system and it kind of manages the uh, containers for OpenShift, which is inside of the Kubernetes uh, layer, which kind of gives you an idea like, hey, okay, Red Hat OpenShift is a flavor of Kubernetes. It's not separate. It's a flavor because now it's built on top of Kubernetes. And then on top of that, you had Red Hat OpenShift, which why do you even have that built in? It's because it gives you a bunch of different tools that you can use. So it kind of turns into like this uh, Super Saiyan. So if you watch, um, what is it? Uh, I forgot what the anime is, but it's a Super Saiyan. <laughs> it comes into the Super Saiyan kind of uh, application where you have the tools of Kubernetes and you have the tools of Docker and things of that sort and kind of combine it into this one thing. And now you have like a the super machine. So if that's something you're interested in, it's kind of a cool program. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper into this layer right here. Oh yeah, Dragon so, Ball Z. So Dragon Ball Z, yes. <laughs> uh, before you were mentioning something about, did I hear you write gears? Can you explain what what Gears is and are they still a thing with OpenShift or are they well, not anymore because of the Kubernetes adaptation? So it's not a thing anymore after they adopted uh, Kubernetes containers to kind of went away with the Gears things because the Gears were, it was just one container and you couldn't make multiple and you couldn't kind of scale. And so they added on, when they, come, when they converged with Kubernetes, it kind of took away the Gears and now you're able to do all these interesting things. You can spin up more pods. You can create these containers without having to worry about doing everything so separately. OK. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yes. And here. So this diagram, which I also made, can look quite daunting <laughs> when you first look at it. I promise <laughs> it's, not that, it's not that bad. So. Again, you have the infrastructure layer, which is where you can have your your clouds or your virtual machines or your servers. That's that's all that good stuff. And you have your um, your service layer here, which that'll be the area where you're kind of defining your pods, your policies, where you're trying to put your IP addresses and your host names for your pods, and where you're kind of configuring your load balancing and things of that sort. And then within that here, you have um, your main nodes, your worker nodes, your persistent storage, your registry. And basically what that means is uh, for your main nodes, you might have the, it's responsible for like managing the cluster and it takes care of like the worker nodes. And it has like four main tasks, which I have that listed in this diagram, which is the API and authentication, which allows the admins to request the APIs. And then you have your data stores, which it stores the state and information. And you have your scheduler, which kind of determines where you're placing your pods and where your memory and your uh, utilization is. And then it has the um, help scaling, which it basically monitors the health of the pods. It scales them based on your, like, your utilization. So for example, if a pod fails, it'll just restart. And if it fails a lot, it'll be marked as like a bad pod and it'll kind of like be paused because that's something you need to look at. And then you have your, your worker nodes, which are on the right side. And it's showing basically uh, where you can have your pods defined, deployed, and managed. And it basically these pods are like your containers and they include your applications and your dependencies and things of that sort. And all your containers, which is that orange. So the orange little box is your container. And inside you have your pods. And each pod kind of shares your same IP address, same volume, 
things of that sort. They can be scaled down, scaled up, um, scaled horizontally. And of course, with these pods, when you're storing things, again, since they are pods, if the pod goes down, you lose all that information. So that's where the persistent storage kind of comes in. It's where you can store things that you don't want to be deleted or things that you don't want to be lost. You would put it in that persistent storage area. And then you have the registries as well, which it just saves your images to your cluster. So it's kind of like a safe haven, if you will. And then you have uh, your routing layer, which is on top and it provides like access to external devices. So like maybe your laptop or, um, you know, where, wherever you posted your application, it's kind of like that area where you can click it and go to, if it's a website or, a, or maybe a game, you can go to where that is. And on the left side, it kind of just gives you an, an uh, observation of how, how the workflow is. So you might have your developer, they're creating their code, they're pushing up to the CI CD pipelines and is going into the Red Hat uh, OpenShift clusters and things of that sort. And then you have your sysadmin or your operator, which is at the bottom, and they, they're able to look into what's going on with the actual uh, application. And it, it uses the uh, Red Hat OpenShift platform to do that, which I'll show that um, later when we go and go play in the OpenShift uh, portal. <laughs> so was that clear? Did I make that clear or? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, there's a question uh, from, from one of our attendees and, and I had a similar thought mm -hmm. as well. So uh, so Red Hat had OpenShift as software that's running on top of Kubernetes that then manages Kubernetes because Kubernetes has some of the like the things that are on that main node, the API, the data store, scheduler, those are core components of Kubernetes. So are those running in a pod that's running OpenShift or? or... So, so the OpenShift platform itself for this version that they have, it's, it's built within Kubernetes. So it's, it's working together as one, if that makes sense. Okay. So, so, so it's in the it's in the control layer with the with uh, the API server and everything and, and the core services. No, I'm not really understanding that question. But from my understanding, it's it's using Kubernetes uh, instances because it is built on top of it. So, if you were to take Kubernetes out of the picture, OpenShift would not run anymore because it's built on, on Kubernetes. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. that, that I explain that clearly. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to read the white papers afterwards, but yes. <laughs> well, yeah, I, that that would be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I am not the end all be all. <laughs> yeah. No, this is this is great stuff. Please continue. Cool, cool. And so I'm going to move over next into kind of going into uh, what's the differences between. OpenShift itself and just Kubernetes by itself, like without the OpenShift abstract of it. So this is kind of interactive a little bit. It's gonna be some sticky notes, <laughs> which I'll kind of be moving around to the side. So basically there's some, there's some terms over here on the left and I'm gonna move it over into left or the right. Matter of fact, I might ask a question and depending on what the answers are, I'll explain and move them over to the left and to the right. Um, now for OpenShift and uh, Kubernetes, there are a couple of differences and this is what we're gonna discuss at this moment. So I have these two uh, sticky notes and they say command line interface and web console interface. Uh, so does anyone wanna kind of guess which one belongs to which? Remember that OpenShift is built on Kubernetes. And if you're familiar with Kubernetes, how do you usually configure your containers and pods? CLI. For I, I'm, not, I'm not answering this. I'll have Chris answer oh. this. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, because because you want the wrong answers. I see how it is. I'm gonna I'm gonna say the the CLI goes to Kubernetes and the web console goes to OpenShift. Okay, so that is actually correct. <gasps> And so it, it's not, it actually won't let me 
move it in um, and presenter mode, but that's fine. So that's actually right. So OpenShift kind of abstracts everything for you. It, <laughs> Okay. It does everything for you. So you don't have to do everything from scratch like you would on Kubernetes. You can kind of use the OpenShift platform, their GUI platform, and you can kind of plug and play, move things around and do things from there. Like you can build, you can deploy, expose, scale, update, all of that stuff on the GUI platform. You don't have to do it through the command line. If you are one of those people who does prefer working on the command line, which would be me, you can still you can still use the command line, but you do have the option now to use the OpenShift platform itself. And so I'm going to go to the next one. These two right here is asking if it's cloud platform or cloud uh, platform agnostic, which means which one which one needs a cloud platform to basically spin itself up and which one does not. All right, this time it's Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I would say cloud platform agnostic is Kubernetes and specific is OpenShift. Actually, no. So <laughs> cloud platform <laughs> agnostic. Suck it, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> cloud platform agnostic would actually be OpenShift and cloud, cloud, cloud platform specific would be Kubernetes. And I'll explain that. So for example, with Kubernetes, you usually don't use Kubernetes by itself. You, you, you usually use um, EKS, which would be uh, elect, which is the Amazon version of Kubernetes, or you might use GKS, which is Google's version of Kubernetes, or you might mm -hmm. use AKS, which is Azure's version of Kubernetes. You will never use it by itself, unless you're like just an amazing person. <laughs> That's but true. It's usually you're usually using some a cloud provider's flavor of open of not OpenShift, a cloud provider's flavor of Kubernetes, whereas OpenShift, you can kind of spin up things within OpenShift itself. And then you can kind of choose what cloud you want to do later. You don't have to immediately use someone else's cloud just to use Kubernetes. So Yeah, that's true. You you wouldn't want to spin up Kubernetes like, you know, the the, the hard way, right? Um, <laughs> and do it on your own. You typically would use that. Yeah. I got confused. Um, for some reason, I was thinking, well, Kubernetes can run on any cloud, so it's platform agnostic. But I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's definitely. So OpenShift makes it easier to deploy clusters anywhere. Yes. Whereas, mm -hmm. yeah. OK, no, that makes sense. Yeah. And if, you're, if you're, using, if you're using OpenShift and you're using Amazon Cloud and you want to switch over to what, Google Cloud, you can do that without having it start over <laughs> and try to figure that out. So that's cool. And so for the next two, you have these here, which is the manual configuration and automated workflows. Uh, which do you think requires a manual configuration and which one can you do an automated workflow? My turn? Your turn, Chris. All right, I'm gonna say <laughs> Kubernetes is a manual configuration and OpenShift is automated workflows. That is actually correct. <laughs> so with OpenShift, it kind of automates everything for you. So you just kind of do a couple of clicks and it starts deploying, it starts automating, <laughs> it starts wrapping components up. You don't have to do everything on your own. So it kind of, I would say it, it handholds you a little bit. Yeah, it handholds you a little bit, but it's less room for error, if that makes sense. Mm. And then the last two, oh, there's, there's four more. So you have uh, these two right here, which is the pre-created templates and source to image. So this is a trick question. So it could apply, it could either be both of them for one or it's either or. Sean. <laughs> Give me the trick questions, don't you, Chris? <laughs> I'm two for two. <laughs> uh, well, I feel like so. Okay, so Kubernetes, I would say, is open source, mm -hmm. and OpenShift is pre-created templates. However, if we talk Helm templates, I would say you can also use pre-created templates in Kubernetes. But I think for just the purpose of these cards, pre-created is under OpenShift, and open source is Kubernetes. So, maybe okay. Let's let's ignore ignore this part just just these two. <laughs> oh, source to image uh 
so sorry. <laughs> oh, this is tricky. Okay, pre-created. I'm still going to stick with my. I'm sticking with my answer. Uh, <laughs> pre-created templates is OpenShift. Source to image is Kubernetes. Okay, so you got the first one right. So they're both actually OpenShift. <laughs> that was a trick question. <laughs> Dang, man. So, if you remember, I talked about the automated workflows with OpenShift. So to even get to those automated workflows, you have to use their templates, which it comes with a whole bunch of templates where you can choose what programming language you want to use, what frameworks, what databases you want to use before you even hook up your application into OpenShift itself. And then it, it can also pull your source code. So if you connect it to GitHub, it'll and you connect it itself it'll pull it and start to um, spin up your application within those containers and it uses the source to image feature. <laughs> so all you have to uh, kind of do is plug in your, your uh, Git link and it'll do literally everything for you. So where you kind of, you kind of just sit there and you're like, oh, this is great. And you have to <laughs> do everything by hand. But of course, when things start failing, you kind of do need to do some tinkering. But as far as setting it up, it's kind of plug and play, if you will. And then the last two, which is open source versus product. So now you can use those two at the bottom <laughs> about uh, which one to go on to each side. <laughs> okay. I think Chris will get this one again because I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna wait. Am I muted? No, I'm, you're there. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it, Sean. I'm gonna throw it back to you because you <laughs> okay. you got you got to get a win. You got to get a win, baby. What are you talking about? Come on. <laughs> All right. Open source is open. No, uh, you already gave us this answer. Uh, so I would say product is open shift and open source is Kubernetes. I should have spoon feed you at least one. <laughs> Yay, Sean. Go team. I got one. I got Yay. one. You are the smartest one. <laughs> You can get a, a piece of Chris's pizza, but <laughs> that's right. I wish pizza looked yeah. good. Yeah, so that was right. So OpenShift is um, a product. It's based on Kubernetes, which is an open source project, though. Hmm. And Kubernetes itself is an open source project. Now, with OpenShift, since it is a product, you if you do use OpenShift, you do get enterprise support and regular updates and all that good stuff that you might not get if you do Kubernetes the hard way, but you probably would do it if you were using a cloud provider's version of Kubernetes. So that was kind of like our fun little hoo-ha <laughs> into OpenShift versus uh, Kubernetes. And so I move over into, I'll call it the fun stuff. So kind of getting a, getting a look into how the OpenShift platform actually looks like and how you can do things. and what exactly I was talking about and how to deploy stuff with just clicks and things of that sort. So that'll go into this question. Can I learn OpenShift? Yes, you can. Um, and a lot of people think that they can't use OpenShift or they can't learn it because they're, you know, OpenShift's kind of expensive. Um, it's not really meant for you to use by yourself on your own. It's like an enterprise software, but they do have a version where you can go on a developer platform and kind of play around and, um, you know, learn how to use it, which I'll come into here. <laughs> so this is their uh, sandbox. They have a sandbox where you can play around and learn how to use Red Hat OpenShift and see how it works with Kubernetes. And they have a bunch of tutorials and things of that sort where you can kind of play around and see what you like. And so I'll kind of, I'll kind of, I'll log into my, my sandbox. I did test it out earlier, so I know it works. <laughs> so if you come into here, like you have this interface, which you have the developer interface and you kind of have the admin slash operator interface. So on the developer side, it gives you an idea of like, you want to look up things. If you want to create your own projects, you can come in here and import from your GitHub or things of that sort, add to databases, create home charts, which I'll show that in a second when I do like a example project <laughs> of how everything works. 
And then you also have the admin view, which if you go into the left corner, you have these two views. So if you go into the admin view, which is kind of like the admin slash operator view, it can give you an insight into like your workloads, all of your pods, your pods and deployments, look into your uh, networking, make sure that your application is actually running, your storage, your builds. You can also go into your user management and you can create roles and accounts. Uh, I think, yeah, you can create different roles and accounts and things of that sort and give people different accesses. And if you want someone to have so is this, would, would, would somebody who's working on an OpenShift cluster, would this be the same interface that they see? Uh, this is just the sandbox interface that anybody can go to? Yeah, yeah the, the, you, you would still, everything would still look the same. It would also okay. depend on your permissions. If you were, if you only had developer permissions, you wouldn't see this admin side. You'd only see this developer side. Hmm. Sure, right, right, okay. Yeah. Um, and, so, and this is available on Red Hat's website, so anybody can go to this and spin up a sandbox yep. to try this. Oh, okay. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> and um, like, I'll do an example here. So if I go and start a sample project, but you can go in here, you can just click around and look. So it gives you all these options based on what language you want to choose. So, say for example, I just wanted to do the basic application with Go. So since it's, a, since it's an um, example, it gives me everything I need. So it kind of gives me this GitHub repo. So it'll pull that source to image up into the platform and it'll create an application. So if I do, oh, cause I already tried it, that's why. So if I do here, I have to rename it. And then I create this project. If you noticed before this, there was nothing here and now you have this application that's spinning up and it's saying it deployed successfully, but that was a little too fast. I don't think it's actually deployed yet. Yeah, it's not, it's not deployed yet, but you can click into this pod and it'll show you that your build is, is starting. This is where your services are running. Your routes are here, still waiting for the build. But it gives you a little bit of details as well. So you can look at your labels, pods, status is updating, so it's not completely um, built yet. You can look at your metrics and see what your uh, application is, how, or how, how it's running, how much memory it's using, the bandwidth, things of that sort. So it's still, it's still building, but you want a, a bigger view it'll come up in here so you can see network IO metrics. If you have an alert, I don't have any alerts set up because it's still new, but you can also query different things. So it's, again, it's all plug and play. It's click, you can click and stuff. You don't have to do everything from scratch. It's done for you, which is why they have this whole platform GUI. So you don't have to do much, kind of just click around. You can see also what the queries are, or if you want to make your own specific queries, you can do that as well. But everything is also still built in for you. You can see the events that are coming up. So you want to see how your pod is going. If anything was restarted, if anything failed, you can see everything here. So it's telling you here, a container was created. It pulled the source image from here. So it's kind of cool, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And you can see your build. So it started a minute ago. So you can see your build and coming through here. It's giving a warning secrets not found, but kind of does everything for you. You can also edit your YAML files if this is not to where you want it to be, but it- Yeah, it really takes a lot of the output you would get from like a describe command or things yeah. like that on the CLI and makes it a lot mm -hmm. more consumable. Yes, it's, it's, it's really good, especially from a, um, an operator perspective because everything's everything's here it's all in one place and wherever whatever was deployed it's here so if it worked on someone else's machine and it's not working on someone else's machine that does not happen here because it's all <laughs> mm. it's all hosted on this on this platform here mm. and you can also see your different 
pods or deployment bigs. And it also kind of spins up a um, dev environment as well. So you might have your dev and your staging and then your production environment, which can also all be hosted on here, which is, to me, it's pretty cool. And you can see just about anything you want to see based yeah, on. Great. So it so it has metrics built in collecting metrics. Does it do the same for logs? I didn't yeah. see any logs over there, but do you have yeah. to set like a separate log collector or does that just happen by default? So let me see if it's completely completely up. You definitely can see logs. So let me go and see if make sure everything is up and running. So yes, and the build is up. We can tell you've spent that. a lot of time in this interface. You 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 fly through it really fast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to see if the if the app was up and running. So it is up and running. So now I can go in, and you can see the metrics are actually updating now, but. So you kind of see it's updating a little bit now. I mean, it's not it's not super intensive because it is a simple application, but you can kind of see mm -hmm. what's being used, how much is used, and where it is. But let me go find those logs for you. Mm -hmm. I, can't I, remember what I guess another question I have, and, and mm -hmm. that's a. Um, would be so when you deploy that as a developer mm -hmm. from from you know your simple go app from github did the administrator like how much does the developer have to do from a kubernetes infrastructure perspective like in that github repo did was there a manifest or was it just go was it just like a go like go code or a bind, you know like was it just go code or was it was there a yaml file that said I want to run a deployment and I want to, you know, have this pod with these specs and all this stuff, or was it just the code and the developer just has to point to his code repo? So you do have to do that initial template kind of setup so that it can plug into what you're trying to deploy, but it's just that one piece. So once you do that one specific uh, couple of files, you don't have to do anything else because OpenShift will kind of take over and take control and get you where you need to be. Okay. If that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, 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 it does. I'm trying to remember where the logs are located. And if, yeah, but that's fine if we can't find them, I wouldn't yeah. want to interrupt your the flow, but that's just, I was just curious. I mean, this is great. I mean, the fact that it can take, you know, things from the CLI that are hard to parse through and you have to use a lot of command line, you know, mm -hmm. tools to, to look at it and view it properly, you know, grep and awk and all kinds of things like and puts it in this consumable format is, mm -hmm. is quite nice. Mm -hmm. You can plug and play different things of that sort if you want to add stuff on you want to add some more stuff to your build process, you can do that as well. And if you prefer using the command line, you can do that. You just have to install it and it's the terminal and you can start here by using the command line or you can install the command line interface for OpenShift on your actual computer. So instead of, instead of using like Qbectl, you would use OCI. So you can do that as well. And as far as the, I was just looking at the logs today, but I'm drawing a blank on where it is now. <laughs> and it is bothering me that I don't know where it is. But yeah, you definitely, but you can look at the logs on here as well. I just don't know where it is. I have no idea. Yeah, I have no idea. But that is what I have so far with OpenShift and Kubernetes and things of that sort. So it's it's a very interesting platform. It's not super hard to learn. Um, if you already know Kubernetes, then 
you will probably fly through this. Mm. <laughs> if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, uh, they do have a learn platform that can teach you a little bit of how everything works. But again, it's meant to kind of be plug and play. So it's not meant to, you know, give you a headache, <laughs> but it is, it is very, uh, a very easy platform to, to learn and use. And it kind of makes your workflow easier. And it, it helps you go into that kind of DevOps philosophy flow where you're not kind of siloed, you're not waiting on someone else to deploy something or fix something. Everything is all in one place. You can see what's not working. The ops side can see what's not working. You know, we devs, uh, the ops side can see what the devs are deploying. The devs can, you know, show what they're up to. So it's kind of like a, a interface if you want to move into that DevOps workflow as well. So it's pretty cool. I like it. And if you want to try OpenShift, I definitely recommend it. <laughs> so that is what I have so far. If anyone wants to ask any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, let's check, Chris, do you see any questions on the Twitter, on the Twitter sphere? I, I've uh, been scoping it, but I don't see anything. I, I, I have, I mean, I just I want to I want to get it installed and I want to start playing with it. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw up an instance of EKS <laughs> and and get OpenShift put on there and just start like kicking the tires on it. But nothing nothing that like I want to I want to bog down the show um, <laughs> get, getting into the weeds about because I don't know what I don't know about it yet. This mm -hmm. this looks really fun though. It's super super cool. And again, if you wanted to have the hold on. Oh, um, Graham's asking, how much Kubernetes do you need to know to get things running? Um, to be honest, when I first learned OpenShift, I, had, I knew nothing about Kubernetes. So oh. if you can spend like a, a day or maybe a couple hours just getting, getting a general knowledge about how to use Kubernetes, you can kind of get started. OpenShift mm -hmm. kind of gets like a, they also kind of give like a, a learn modules to get you up to speed so that you can use OpenShift as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not that it's, it's not like you have to be an expert in Kubernetes to use OpenShift platform. You could be brand new, which is kind of what they tout. You don't have to be at certain levels to use their platform. They kind of teach you along the way. And as you're clicking and stuff, you'll kind of, you'll kind of be like, oh, okay, this does this, this does that. I'm not really sure why I'm doing this. Let me just go ahead and Google and their docs will pop up and their docs are pretty Full fledged, like you can you can spend days on your docs. So, <laughs> and nice. there's a bunch of people on bunch of people on YouTube where if you're confused on something, they have if if it's something that you're confused about, someone's probably written about it or they wrote a YouTube video about it or things of that mm -hmm. sort, which mm -hmm. is what I found a lot when I was first learning. So it's very accessible, and whatever questions you might have or if you're confused about something, it's it's not where you just have to know. Kubernetes in its entirety before you even start with OpenShift. And Wonderful. again, you can use their developer learn platform, which it's free to use because they want you to learn OpenShift and they want you to learn Kubernetes and they want you to learn a little bit about Docker because again, they all they are a part of that same community where they contribute and everyone kind of builds up the entire mm -hmm. Kubernetes and OpenShift. So can, can you post, can you paste those links into the, uh, into the chat? And uh, we'll, yeah. we'll get them into the show notes. Yeah, we'll make sure to capture those for sure. So here's that. And there's a little bit about um, why they chose to build off of uh, Kubernetes. And here's another link. If I know people are like, they love getting uh, badges when they learn something. So if that's you, and you want to learn about Kubernetes and OpenShift at the same time, <laughs> there is this um, there is this learning uh, module where it'll teach you a little bit about Kubernetes, a little bit about OpenShift and how to use it together. And like at the end of it, when you finish it, which is three modules, and like you'll do three projects, and then there's a quiz at the end. And if you pass all that or you know you do a good job, you'll get a badge at the end. So I'm a badge person. So nice. Sean, Sean's <laughs> already taken the quiz. He is such a badge person. He absolutely will do that. He loves his I don't badges. have a badge, I would, but I would like the badge. But you know, we link that here as well. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm not oh. even joking. He he told he loves taking certification exam. Any any way that he can put more letters at the end of his name, he is, he is now. <laughs> wow, how many letters do you have? <laughs> He's got all the AWS certs. No, mm -hmm. no, I don't. Not no, yet. Which one? Which one are you missing? Security. The practitioner and the Alexa. You you okay? Alexa was discontinued, so it no longer exists. And cloud practitioner, really, Sean? Well, and they have new ones now, I think. They have like the SAP one and oh, shut yeah. up. Just shut but up. I don't have the gold jacket, man. I, I should have gotten it though before there's like too many. There's like 300 certs now. It's too much. It's Whatever. too much. <laughs> Diamond, this this was this was fantastic. Thank you very much. I am I am really excited to uh to spin up a little cluster and and um, throw, throw OpenShift on top of that and start kicking the tires on this. Thank you for, uh, for the presentation. This was good. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. I've been meaning to get more and more insight into OpenShift, and this has been super helpful. I'm definitely going to be checking out these links. Really this appreciate This is way better than time. K9s. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I'm glad I was able to give some information out. <laughs> yeah, totally. Cool. Well, uh, Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you to our attendees and, and thank you to our to our, our guest, Diamond. Really appreciate it. Um, we will get this up to uh, YouTube shortly and uh, see you all same time, same place next week. Bye team. Bye. <laughs>